Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Inventor Club, March 2024. It's been an amazing month. There's been so much action and innovation that I've had the opportunity to run into. Actually, this morning, I was in New York City uh, meeting with the Commissioner of Patents, Vidali. Uh, it was amazing. And uh, we were talking about just kind of the path of what an inventor goes through when they come up with an idea to the patent side of things. And we got some real good insights. I happened to be hosting a fireside chat with her. It was uh, really inspirational and it was streaming on the app this morning. So you could take a look at the uh, recording uh, afterwards. So uh, that was uh, an event this morning that was a lot of fun. So just getting back now, we have our National Inventor Club meeting. And uh, Vishali, uh, the Commissioner Vishali, uh, the Commissioner of Patents, also talked about the amazing resources that are available from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So we have a few members of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office with us today, and we'll go through that. The conversation was very insightful, and it was so nice to see some of the National Inventor Club members that were local that actually came down. So Chris Foley, shout out, uh, Tarkin. Um, we had uh, Herb was there, um, Alexis. Uh, I don't want to leave anyone out. Ryan was there. So it was great to, to have you in the audience. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Just a couple other quick announcements. Uh, as far as the National uh, Inventor Club, we stream in the Inventor Smart app. So we've upgraded the Inventor Smart app to improve our group features, making it easier to find conversations and engage with our various offerings. If you haven't already, please visit the app uh, to check it out. You can go to Inventor Smart Community on uh, Google Play Store or Apple App Store, and you can download it and be a part of all the activity uh, on there. Our first book club meeting this month was a big hit, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to be announcing more of the book clubs. We had the members come in, and I happened to uh, start off with my first book, How to Make Money with Your Invention Idea. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And those who participated actually got a copy sent uh, to them of my book. And we went through different parts of things that were kind of uh, where people were stuck with their inventions. And hopefully we uh, shared and networked and uh, helped to keep our ideas moving forward. So that was a lot of fun. A special call out to our premium insiders. We're eager to feature you on our upcoming Inventor Spotlight podcast. So if you're interested in sharing your story and inventions, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. We also have the Insider's Digest packed with the latest insights to give our readers an edge. Uh, it's been sent to all premium insiders at the start of the month. It is a lot of information. Don't miss the next edition scheduled for release on Monday, April 1st. Another great reason to be a premium insider if you're not already. Our help desk is expanding. We're rolling out FAQ articles to help you maximize your in-app experience. For any technical or support questions, please post them in the help desk group for a prompt response from one of our team members. Don't forget, we're hosting a live networking session on Zoom right here. Uh, Right after the meeting, you should have received a Zoom link. So right after tonight's meeting, everyone is invited, and we look forward to seeing you there. We're also in the final stages uh, of partnering with a renowned uh, health and wellness practitioner to add an el element of mental health and well-being to our community offerings. And lastly, don't miss out on our virtual meet and greet uh, and online co-working event next week. Um, the exact date is to be determined, but stay tuned for your email and the app for more information. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a networking event with all the members inside the app. That's going to be a lot of fun. And as Chef Emeril uh, says, famously said, we're really cooking here. <laughs> so we have a lot of fun stuff that's happening in the app. So thank you. And we're so grateful to be on this journey with you. Now let's get uh, the show started. So it's going to be a lot of fun tonight. Um, so let's start off with John Schneider. He is from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And welcome to National Inventor Club, John. 
please uh, just briefly introduce yourself and tell us what kind of tips or information that you have for the inventor community tonight. Thanks, Brian, and thanks for having us back. We always enjoy working with your group to help promote our efforts to ensure that independent inventors are successful when they come before us on the board. And what I'd like to share with you are a couple of information meetings that we have for you that are coming up that I think your members will find interesting. First, of course, is our monthly inventor hour series. Uh, that will be uh, next Thursday, the 28th of March, beginning at noon Eastern time. It's a very interesting program. We're going to be interviewing the deputy chief judge of the board, Judge Jackie Bonilla. She is also serving as the chief legal advisor to the director of the patent office, Director Vidal. Uh, we'll also will have a segment on conference calls with judges in AIA proceedings. And then I will be presenting an interesting episode about an inventor from history, a lady named Maria Beasley, who was sort of an unknown but very prolific inventor in the 1800s. We also have our appeal road shows. These are sort of mock hearings where we present them to the public so you can see how the hearings work, learn about the details of it, and get a little bit of insight of how the judges operate during these proceedings. We have two of them coming up. The first one is on April 4th in Indianapolis at the Indianapolis Central Library. And the second one will be on May 2nd in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Free Public Library in, at the Parkway Central Library. Uh, these events and information about them can obviously be found on the Patent Office website at uspto.gov. And if you go to the search bar, you can find these events. And lastly, for those of you who are, uh, are interested in it, there is going to be a program called Pathways to Inclusion. This will be both a live and virtual event held at Emory University in Atlanta. And it's a program as part of our patent pro bono program to help you learn about the different government resources for starting and maintaining successful business, including protecting your IP, both from the patent side and from the trademark side. All these events are free. As I mentioned, even the program in Emory will be done virtually. For the patent uh, roadshow or the appeal roadshow, if you can't make that, we're actually going to be doing a version of it in our May Inventor Hours. So if you can't get to either Philadelphia or Indianapolis, please tune in in May and join our program. And now I'm going to depart a little bit from patent office information to make a request to your club. And I'm going to literally change hats here. So give me a second. Well, as you may now recognize it, this is an old Boy Scout hat from when I was a Boy Scout 40 years ago. But what I'm asking for you today is I need your help. I am still an adult volunteer with Scouts, and we're going to be hosting a Inventing Merit Badge series coming up in the Dallas area in the end of September. And I was wondering if there's any members from this group that be willing to help us out, come speak to the Scouts, help inspire the next generation of inventors. Realizing that Boy Scouts now is Scouts BSA, and we reach out to both young men and young women and hope to inspire them in their careers and fields. So if anybody would like to help John help me out, my email address is john.schneider, S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R, at eusbto.gov. I'd be great if you could help us inspire the next generation of inventors and get them leading on the path the way you did, and hopefully maybe learn from what you've done and move on. With that, I thank you, Brian, for the opportunity, and I'll try to zoom, tune in on the Zoom program at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And if you're in the Dallas area, you can be a part of the, the Boy Scout uh, event that you have. That's correct. And you're you're giving inventor merit badges, or is you're that what it is? Earn the inventor merit badges. They're actually going to be required to come up with an invention. Wow. But they need to learn about the inventing process and what it takes and also how to commercialize it. This will also probably tie it in with the Entrepreneur Merit Badge as well. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, as always, for joining you and, and your colleagues uh, for joining uh, National Inventor Club. We appreciate it. Thank you for having us on, and we hope to continue our work with you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, John, uh, when I was at the uh, New York Public Library today um, with the Commissioner of Patents, um, Vishali, um, we also... Uh, had the I, I had a chance to see Elizabeth Doherty there and some of the other colleagues um, from Director uh, Vidal's office and uh, and some of the other staff. I was given this pen 
from Elizabeth Doherty this morning as a gift from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And she told me that this would happen to be the, the bookcase or the, the draw, I guess the, the shoe box that patents were stored in, in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and they converted the, the wood into a pen. So there's a few of these, and I got the honor of getting one today. And I've written up all my notes for this meeting with this pen, and it works fantastic, but very interesting. Yeah, our patent files used to be called shoes because the, the drawers they were kept in were also used as uh, inventory for shoes and shoe stores. So it just happened to be just the right size. That's what and I that, got here. <laughs> there were all wooden cases. Actually, believe it or not, some of those shoes are still in use in our plant pack patent section. Wow. So. Good stuff. Well, thank you again, John, and, and thank you. We appreciate having you here. My pleasure. Speak to you soon. Okay, let's have Bridget Weston. For those of you who might recognize Bridget, Bridget was on National Inventor Club. Uh, I think it's it was last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bridget and I and her colleagues, we've done some webinars together, and we've had some great uh, feedback and I know National Inventor Club members have also been a part of SCORE, and uh, we're happy to have you back, Bridget. If you can share with us what SCORE does, a little bit about yourself, and uh, and how we can be a part of SCORE. Sure. Thank you so much, Brian, for having me back here. I really appreciate what you do to help bring people together, and the National Inventors Club is just such an amazing resource for inventors and aspiring entrepreneurs and existing entrepreneurs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, SCORE is a nationwide network of business mentors who volunteer their time and expertise to help anyone looking to start or grow their business or even exit their business. We have over 10,000 mentors across the country, and they have that been there, done that expertise to help you all um, you know, navigate your business journey, figure out what the next steps are to help achieve your definition of success. Um, we've actually worked with the um, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office as well, doing webinars, talking about how mentors can support on that journey through the patent or trademark um, journey. We have people that have worked at USPTO um, or gotten patents themselves. And so if that is you and that's where you are in your journey, I would encourage you to check out score.org. You can browse the mentor profiles. 10,000, there's a lot. So if you're not sure how to get started, you can also just put in your zip code and fill out that form. And we'll ask you a couple questions and pair you with the best mentor that fits your needs. The other thing I wanna let everyone know about is that coming soon is National Small Business Week. So SCORE has partnered um, with the SBA to put on a two-day virtual summit. Um, it's gonna be April 30th and May 1st from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time. And it's really not just about, you know, the educational content and the presentations, but we are specifically working to have action driven content and plenty of time to network with the experts, the sponsors and your peers. So I would encourage you to check that out. You can find all of that information and more on score.org. Um, and what I want to tell you is Mentoring works. We just did our client engagement study, and last year we found out or we saw that SCORE helped over 31,000 businesses get started, and we helped to add over 110,000 jobs because of the mentoring and education that we partner with you all along your business journey. So thanks again for giving me this time. I encourage you all to check us out, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around to answer them. Thank you so much. Do you see... Bridget is on with us. She has 10,000 mentors from SCORE that are ready and willing to help you and mentor you. And how much does it cost, Bridget? I'm so glad you asked, Brian. It is always free. No matter how many times you meet with your mentor, we have had people have their mentors for 20 plus years, um, and it is always free. So reach out. Can't go wrong. Quick question your relationship with the Small Business Administration? We are a resource partner of the Small Business Administration. Um, so we are not, you know, we receive funding from Congress, but we are not directly with the SBA. We do partner with them on many things. Great. Bridget, thank you so much. I love working with you and your, your team. 
Cody and, and the crew there, we do some great webinars. We've incorporated and included the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and we've had uh, Shark Tank uh, contestants that were on. A lot of fun, great action, great participation. So thank you, and uh, we'll, we'll keep uh, our partnership going. Yeah, thanks, thanks so for much. the continued partnership, Brian. It's a pleasure to work with you. Likewise. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks for, for thanks. joining us tonight. Okay. Uh, next, let's have Billy Clouser. Hello, Billy. How are hey, you? Hey, Brian. How are you doing? So interesting. I've had a chance to meet some of your colleagues over the last couple of weeks, and uh, you are from Erdic Works. That's correct. Can you tell us a little bit about what you what you have uh, to share with the inventor community? Very interesting, and we're going to keep expanding on our relationship so we can uh, we can definitely get this out to the inventor community. So Billy, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at uh, Erdic Works. Sure. So Brian, I'm a senior, senior innovation project manager at Erdic Works. We are a nonprofit that supports the uh, US Army Engineering Research and Development Center uh, located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. So Erdic is a the research arm of the US Army uh, but not only for the U.S. Army, but also other DOD uh, entities and also other federal agencies. So ERDIC is researching multiple different topics. You think about civil works, infrastructure, uh, military engineering, climate, uh, cyber, uh, digital to twins, you just name it. They're researching everything that you can think of related to those topic areas. So ERDIC Works is a, uh, like I said, a nonprofit uh, we are a, under a PIA, under an uh, entity called Defense Works. We're one of 10 innovation hubs uh, around the U.S. that supports other federal agencies and other DOD entities. So our, our, our purpose at Erdit Works is we're, we're a neutral facilitator that supports uh, fair and open competition for industry and academia to come in and provide a solution to uh, to Erdit Works on the problem they may have. So if they have a solicitation out there, we're out looking for industry and academia partners that can come in and provide that solution. And we call that our tech transition, which is what we say is spin in. But we also support uh, Erdit on their tech commercialization. They, over, they have over 100 patents and we support a little over 30 of those patents that we reach out to industry uh, looking for partners to come in to commercialize that technology. So we sort of have a dual role with uh, supporting Erdic. Like I said, it's that tech transition spin in and that tech, uh, commercialization, tech commercialization, what we call spin out. So we're always looking for to grow our ecosystem. Uh, we're looking for entities and partners that you have in, in your ecosystem to reach out and let, you know, industry uh, entrepreneurs know that there's opportunities for them to come in and provide a solution. And uh, real quick, just, uh, you know, it's, it's real simple for entrepreneurs or entities that may have a solution. They can come in. Uh, they can go to our website at artitworks.org and look at the different multiple uh, open solutions or open solicitations that are open that that Artic is uh, wants to reach out to them. And they can submit a simple three page white paper. So we have all the formatting and how you need to proceed uh, to do that. So uh, we encourage your your. Um, you know, your ecosystem to, you know, check our website out and, and sort of see there. And if they have any questions, they can feel free to reach out to me at W Clouser, uh, W K L A U S E R at artitworks.org. Thank you, Billy. So what you're saying is that you're the marketing arm for government agencies that are looking for innovation and you kind of aggregate those opportunities, you put them on your website and us as inventors, if we fit the criteria of one of those opportunities, we would fill out a white or we would pr uh, present a white paper. Uh, we would show you our intellectual property. And if chosen, tell us, just give me a little bit more there. What yeah. Yeah. So, so once it comes through our, once you submit it through our portal, then we send it over to Erdic. They evaluate it. They say, okay, yes, this is something we want to move forward with. Then they will, at that point in time, then they'll reach out to the, the inventor. Uh, 
the entity that submitted that white paper and they'll start that contracting process, which is all done by uh, Erdic. Excellent. I know there's a little bit more fine print to that, but oh, yes, but having uh, possibly the U.S. Army, different types of government agencies that are interested in your patent and then you kind of help to commercialize it for us. That's correct. And, and That's fund correct. it. Uh, and, and we kind of uh, have some kind of, uh, I guess, some kind of return in there also, which That's we right. can discuss. But it's That's great right. to know that your organization exists. I happen to stumble upon it. And uh, I've been speaking to your colleagues. And hopefully we're going to have a, a bigger, expanded, uh, and maybe just do a complete National Inventor Club night. Uh, so we can great. learn more about what, what you and your colleagues do. Thank you so much, Billy. That'd be great. Thanks, Brian. Pre appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, let's have Will Salas. He is from the uh, PTRC, which is the Patent Trademark Resource Center. He is in Smithtown, New York. I was with Peter from the New York Public Library Division or the New York City Division of the PTRC, Patent and Trademark Resource Center. Will, long time no see. We're happy to have you back. We caught you on one of the nights that you're not helping inventors at the library. So if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and what you what you do for inventors. Well, thank you, Brian. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, the Smithtown Library PTRC, Patent and Trademark Resource Center. What we do is we're librarians first. We wear a lot of hats, and one of the hats I wear is a PTRC representative. I am accredited as well as my library to with uh, the United States Patent and Trademark Resource Center to disseminate patent and trademark information and help everyday people kind of navigate the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, the US PTO websites, and find information pertinent to their invention or their mark. Now, there are PTRCs all over the country. There are 85 of them. Um, we are always welcome people to come and visit with us. If you're in the Smithtown, Long Island, New York area, you can come visit with me or we can visit with you. Many of us offer a virtual reference. Um, we've been open since 2013, so we celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. We're very proud of ourselves. Also last year, I had my very first international patent and trademark research center session with a uh, very young, uh, a wonderful young lady uh, in Moldova. She's actually a student here in Long Island who is teaching English in Moldova, and she decided to start a travel agency there and needed to register a trademark with the United States. So we really meet some interesting people. Um, you've had some very interesting speakers already. What a great team you're working with, and you really gotta build a team around yourself when you're working uh, to start a business and to patent or trademark, because it's hard to go it alone. And we're out there to help you at a, at a PTRC. And there are PTRCs near you. So rather than tell you, let me show you, Brian, it's been a little while, so I'm gonna try and present my screen onto yours. So while you're doing that, Will, uh, so PTRCs, they will help you when you have an idea. They will go into the archives of the US Patent and Trademark Office databases, and they will pull and, and show you how to kind of compare what you have to what's already existing out there. If you ask Will, what do you think about my idea? He's not gonna tell you, but he can show you where you can pull prior art and, and claims, take a look at those type of things. And then you can make a decision by yourself, or you could take what you find with either Will or one of his colleagues at, uh, at a PTRC near you, you can take that information and you can give it to a patent attorney or agent and have them compare if possibly your idea has some potential uh, to get patented or not. That's true, Brian. We don't give legal or business advice. So everything I do by demonstration, I do with fictitious entities, companies, and fictitious inventions. But if you're seeing my screen now, it's the USPTO.gov uh, database. Are you seeing that screen, Brian? Yes, we are. Yep. All righty. So to find other patent and trademark resource centers near you, you're gonna hover over the learn and resources link here. Oh, no, thank you. And on the drop down in the very first column, you're gonna see a link for research and librarians. Click on that and there you are at the patent and trademark resource center homepage. So if you'd like to visit with me or visit with me virtually, you can, but if you'd like to find someone closer to home, you can find PTRC locations by state. 
simply click on, and as you see, they're all over, heavily concentrated on the East Coast. There I am in Smithtown, New York. You click on that link, and next thing you know, in a short while, you're going to be able to connect with my PTRC webpage at the Smithtown Library with my contact information, and I'd be very happy to meet with any of you at my library. And again, I can meet with you virtually. Now, one more thing I want to show you back at the USPTO.gov website is the, the USPTO is offering a very interesting initiative. Brian, are we back at the homepage? Yes. Uh, no, nope, not yet. Okay. So here we are back at the homepage. Just a moment. There you go. So what I want to sh share with everyone is something called the First Time Filer Expedited Examination Pilot Program. That's a lot of words, but let me show you how to find information about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to hover over this initiatives tab here, and the organization that's offering it is the Council for Inclusive Innovation. Once we click on that tab, we want to scroll down a little ways, and under the initiatives section, we have the title of the program, First Time Filer Expedited Examination Pilot Program. And again, this is this is for first time filers. So what it does is when you file for a patent, you could be waiting quite a while before you get that first action from your patent examiner. All the while there could be business dealings that you're trying to make. They could be fabricators, manufacturers, designers, other partners that are kind of waiting on whether or not your patent idea is really patentable. Well, if you file for this for this program, and once you get accepted and you get onto a certain examiner's uh, list, the turnaround time will be roughly about 28 days before you get your first action from the patent examiner, which could make a big deal if you're holding up the works just to get a better idea if your invention really is patentable. So Excellent. it's free of charge. It's just been renewed. The program started on March 11th, and it's going to run through March 11th of 2025. or when they reach their first 1,000, when they give out their first 1,000 grants. So if you want to move up to the front of the pile and get a decision made sooner and hear about how your patent uh, application is working out, please take advantage of this. And again, it is for first timers. I encourage you to take a look at the, at the um, webpage for the first time filer expedited examination pilot program. And good luck to you for all you Thank first timers. You. And if you're a first timer, again, you have some free resources near you at a public or, or a state or a university library, us patent and, trademark, patent and trademark resource centers. We can show you by demonstration how to begin your patentability search and how to use the trademark search, which is brand new. It just was released out in November. So there aren't too many experts out there yet. So come by and see us and we'll show you how it works. Thank you, Will. Thank you very Brian. much. We appreciate what you do for the inventor community, people with ideas showing them how to search the databases. Thank you, and a free resource, by the way, and you can find more information on the patent, uh, USPTO.gov website. Thank you very much, Will. We'll see you again soon. Pleasure. You'll join us in the Zoom, I think, also, right, in the after meeting networking. Excellent, yeah. thank you. Okay, uh, let's have, uh, let's see, let's have Steve Greenberg. Let's have a little fun here, Steve. So I've known Steve probably for, I don't know, probably almost 20 years, if not more. And uh, Steve, let's take you off a of mute there. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your gadget game show? Well, I you know actually started sometime towards the end of the pandemic. I wanted to create a platform where we could show innovative products. There's Shark Tank, of course, and you know segments on television around the country. But I wanted to see if we could have another platform that was sort of like, what's my line meets Shark Tank, where we could show a new product and have people ask questions about it, like try to figure out what it is. And at the end, of course, it's a reveal, so you can then promote the product. So um, that's what the, what the heck is that is all about. Here's the show's logo right there. And if you go to gadgetgameshow.com and you just click on the red button there, it takes you right to the YouTube channel. It's also on DBTV. So uh, if you like to, if you think you you love gadgets and you think you like a game show, you should check it out. And so we can play a couple of a quick round right here. I've got a gadget here to see how 
You know, we all know Brian's got a, a, an amazing gadget IQ. So does he know this product? So I'm going to show it to him right here. It looks like an electric. Oh, I thought it was an electric toothbrush. It looks like a mini vacuum. So it's got a, a an opening right here. It okay. also has a little opening right over here. Mm -hmm. And this is a gadget. I've, I've blocked the name, which is over here. So that's what the blue tape represents. So ask a couple of yes or no questions to see if you can figure it out and then try and do a wild guess and guess what the heck is that? Is it is it something for used after you're drinking? No, I I, I don't think that's no. I would I have to say that's a no. Okay. It does does it a problem though? It does solve a problem. Okay. Does it help me with uh, increasing my lung capacity? Nope, nothing to do with breathing though. Okay. I, I but I I hear where you're going with that. But you okay. Kind of there, yeah. Well, let's see. Um, is there, you know, you know what? Let, let's let's have Harrison. He's been waiting patiently on Harrison. I need your help here. I would wonder, does anything flow through it? Well, when you're using it, something does flow through it when you're using it, and it does solve a problem. So really, if you figure out the problem, that will tell you what this is all about. And again, probably the best thing I give you is got this large opening right here and kind of a smaller opening right down here hmm. and that difference that ratio actually is kind of critical to making it work oh boy Let, let's let's what give you one, think, one. Ryan? i don't know <laughs> sean what do you think <laughs> no um does it attach to one or two devices no I, it i can tell you it attaches to a person and something else but and it connects those two things but not two devices. And uh, there's no batteries in this thing. It's basically hollow. It's as oh, wow. gadget as you can get. And, and I want the viewers to keep in mind. What the heck is it? Dreams in the world of gadgets. So Tell us, Steve. Tell <laughs> us. I can't take it anymore. Okay. Well, here it is. This is called Hickaway. And what it does is it stops hiccups. So what you do is you put this in a glass of water, and then you suck in, and that 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 fight between that little tiny space and the large one right here causes a little battle inside you. And that little distraction kind of restarts your hiccup. Anyway, <laughs> I've well, tried it. I've used it. It actually works. And it wow. Pick away. Uh, wow. It has it in a bunch of other spots as well. Very interesting. Well, usually, you know what? I think my answer was right because usually after I have a drink, I get the hiccups. Well, you know, actually, when you said that, I was thinking, I wonder if that's kind of where we were, but I, that's why I kind that's of had all right. I, I'm going to just show you this one. Okay, here's another one. And I'm not going to give you the answer because the way to find the answer to this gadget is you got to check out episode 84. It's on, mm. if you go to gadgetgameshow.com. And you can check it out. It's a really good gadget. I use this one all the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be good for you too. So the only way to find out what it is, go to episode 84, gadgetgameshow.com. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Everybody gets a guess. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm going last. <laughs> okay. Uh, Harrison, I, I can't see everybody's name. I'm going to put my glasses on. Um, something that attached to the back of a chair. Uh, it does attach to something, but not a chair. It has okay. some things on it right here. Okay, that was very good. Next, Abraham, give me a yes or no question on this. Oop. She got my uh, my my guess with lumbar support. <laughs> Not, but. Uh, lumbar support? No, no. Okay, uh, Francine. Oh my gosh! I is it something you use in the house? Actually, no. You'd use it outside. I would say it. It rarely would you use it in the house. It's definitely an outside oh, no. thing. Oh, okay, wow. now we'll go to Harrison. Harrison. Is it used to reflect things back at you or rebound something? Oh, great idea. I could definitely see that because it just has this bouncy mesh. But nope, not for that. Brian? Oh, I was going to say something like that, Harrison. Um, oh, man. And this gap is important to this function. Uh -huh. The gap. Is important. But I'm not going to give the answer away. You're going to have to go to get. Oh, do you put a baby? Do you rest the baby on there? No, no. You don't All right. So you're not telling us the answer. We have to go. Don't, we don't want people to leave our, our show right now. It's over. I just, okay. Just remember the name, gadgetgameshow.com. Oh, that is tough, Steve. And you'll find out what it is. Oh, I can't believe you're doing that to us. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> and of course, you. check out the other episodes as well, too. Fine. So also, uh, maybe you can join us in oh, the wow. uh, in the Zoom after meeting. So maybe you can tell us uh, d- directly. Okay, but we'll see. see. <laughs> All right. Four hands. Yeah. All right. Thank oh, wow. you, Steve. Thank you. All right. Tough one. Wow. That was Harrison, awesome. Thank you, Steve. We're, we're going to meet you in just a moment, Harrison, and we're going to keep on the other uh, inventors. So, Steve, thanks for that. And thank you for oh, wow. leaving us in suspense. We appreciate that. See you soon. All right. So, uh, Sean, you are our chief community officer of the Inventor Smart community. Uh, and uh, Samantha couldn't join us tonight. She is the uh, VP of Community. So thank you both for all you do. Sean, you'd like to introduce a couple of our uh, premium insiders? Um, yes. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> and, uh, and welcome, 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 everyone. Um, my name is Sean. I am, like Brian said, the um, Chief Community Officer. And today we have Francine with the original blowout that's um francine you want to take a minute and um tell us about your invention and and where you're from hi everybody first of all thank you and thank you brian for having me uh my name's francine i'm from stratford connecticut and um let's see this started uh back in 2016 um, well, first of all, I owe it to my mom. Uh, I, I have a love of, of cooking and baking for my Italian mom. Um, and I've always wanted to open up a restaurant. And uh, well, that never happened. But my two boys said, hey, mom, why don't you open up a bakery? And I'm like, a bakery? Oh, my God. No, that's even worse. No. So I, I nixed that idea. So I'm sitting home one day in October of 2016. And I'm by myself. And I'm saying, hmm a bakery. And then right away, what popped into my head was, um, was a birthday cake and how everybody, when you're blowing out your birthday candles, you're spewing spitting germs all over. Well, Mm -hmm. I'm a germaphobe and I've always have been. And I thought, Oh my God, I wonder if I can, if I can invent something, uh, you know, to stop the germs from being on a birthday cake. So I went into my cabinet and I got the tip of my decorating tip. When you decorate cakes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I um, blew through it and I felt the end and I went, Ooh, this is pretty strong. So I rolled papers, long ones, thin ones, wide ones, whatever. I documented all my findings and fast forward, the original blowout came into, into, uh, was born. Let me just say that. Francine, what we do is you have a birthday cake and instead of blowing out the cake, Yep. Now you blow into the original blowout, right? And uh, you have become the inventor spotlight in the <laughs> Inventor Smart Community app. It was just posted prior to our meeting today, so we very much appreciate what you've come up with, and uh, we can stay connected for everybody out there can stay connected with you in the Inventor Smart app. Oh wow! Great, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> Francine. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. And we have Abraham Espadas from the Espadas Innovations. Tell us uh, uh, who you are, where you're from, and uh, what's your invention of service. Glad to have you here. Come off mute, Abraham. uh, Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate the, the. Yes, I think there's a little lag here, but uh, thank you for having me and I appreciate being a part of the community. I've been searching for a community like this for some time and mm-hmm. I had the privilege of meeting Brian. Uh, and, uh, he's, he's been a great resource. So uh, who I am, uh, I'm a new inventor. Uh, this is my first uh, invention that I'm working through the market and through the patent process. I live in beautiful Southern California um, and I my invention is not just just ready to get uh, launched out there, but I'm uh, working with Brian uh, and all the details and some of the, a lot of the resources that he's provided uh, for me to be able to continue on the design uh, process. So mm-hmm. for those who are looking for a coach, a mentor, I highly recommend Brian and his team uh, Thank to you, help Brian. out with that. Uh, but, but, Thank you. But my, uh, my, my, my invention is uh, just uh, to, to help out consumers with uh, delivering packages to their home in a secure way. 
uh, hope, okay. I hope to share more of it in the near future with the community. Thank you so oh, much. We're looking forward to it. We and welcome, welcome so, everyone. Let's all let's all stay connected in the in the app. You can download it on the Google Play Store, or Apple App Store, Invent a Smart Community. You can meet Abraham and Francine and and uh, Sean and everybody that's in the uh, community. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. And uh, we have a great guest, so I'm I'm really excited. Yes. Uh, we have Harrison Burt. He's from Start Engine, and we are going to find out more about crowdfunding and about just trying to figure out a way to fund our invention. Maybe we do want to start a business with it. Maybe we do want to create this whole new brand. And we're not exactly sure if we have enough funds. So maybe the, we, we need some options. And that's why we have Harrison Burt from Start Engine. If you go to Start Engine, you see who a lot of you recognize which is uh, Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary. So I know that uh, when many of the inventors that were looking that Start Engine was coming on, they researched Start Engine and they saw Kevin O'Leary and they wanted to know a little bit more about how Kevin O'Leary, but first, Harrison's our guest tonight. So Harrison, welcome to National Inventor Club. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and Start Engine. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Brian. I could never take the spotlight from Kevin, but <laughs> appreciative of the time here and of everyone who's joined and everyone who's spoke, spoken. Some pretty impressive uh, people and ideas and inventions. But I'm the director of fundraising at Start Engine, and we're one of the largest equity crowdfunding platforms in the United States. So we really specialize in helping founders and entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses from anyone in the general public. So we try to approach the democratization of finance and capital from the founder perspective, allowing them to raise capital from anyone and really opening up the world of fundraising when it's been really difficult the last few years. And then on the investor side, democratizing their access to alternative investments um, where there have been really outsized returns over the last three to four decades for a very small proportion of the population. So excited to speak to you today. And Kevin has been a, a great brand ambassador for us. We were actually down at his um, company symposium in Miami very recently, meeting some of his portfolio companies from O'Leary Ventures, but he's been a great brand ambassador for us um, over the last several years. That's great. So Harrison, we've heard about Indiegogo, we've heard about Kickstarter, and there's also Start Engine. So these are crowdfunding type of platforms. And if you can just start off and tell us what type of companies, because our community may not necessarily be in your wheelhouse, but I thought it would be amazing to have you on because that could be a goal for an inventor at some point, but you're very familiar with the crowdfunding space. You're very familiar with asking friends and family for funding or maybe your next door neighbor, I guess they could be your, your friend uh, or family, um, but also uh, series A, series B, we hear all these things and we don't know 100% what they all mean. Plus, when do we ask for money? Mm -hmm. So if you can help clear some of those things up for us, because look, we start off, we have this idea, we get it to a point where either we can't do it ourselves, or maybe we just kind of run out of funds. Do we license it to earn royalties or do we raise money? So Harrison, if you can help to kind of start off with telling us what our options are as inventors, entrepreneurs, startups that are out there. Absolutely. And I think it's helpful to contextualize that as you look at the life cycle of an invention and maybe that becomes a startup and then it gets commercialized and truly becomes a business that's generating a lot of revenue. And I think it's important to differentiate what I'll call rewards-based crowdfunding, which I'm sure a lot of people listening tonight are familiar with platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, where you're really pre-selling products in a way with the hope of delivering those units to your backers sometime in the future. And a lot of times that's a great way to fund the initial development, the initial product run of, a, of an invention, for example. 
I tend to view equity crowdfunding as the older sibling of products crowdfunding. And it really suits companies when they're at a stage where you are ready to really grow a business and you're ready to move to the next stage of having filed your patents and delivered initial prototypes or units to potential backers from a rewards-based crowdfunding platform like a Kickstarter to really thinking about a go-to-market strategy and a commercialization plan and committing yourself to growing your business. And I think there's a, a shift that happens where you go from being an inventor to being an entrepreneur and being a founder. And that's where Start Engine can typically step in and help companies raise capital um, our sort of core focus is raises in the one million to seventy five million dollar range using a variety of different regulations. Now, that can be done in tandem with what you mentioned, a friends and family raise, for example. And generally, when you hear this nomenclature about a pre-seed round and a seed round and a series A, um, in my world, I typically see companies raising their pre-seed round from friends and family and right going to their neighbors, going to their siblings, their parents, people in their community and raising the first right couple hundred thousand dollar round size from those people, potentially up to a million generally. And I like to view Start Engine and equity crowdfunding as a form of growth equity that typically comes in for a seed round potentially after your pre-seed raise, when you may be already commercialized and in market, or you have um, a technology that you're working on that's very capital intensive and may take several rounds of funding before you are able to commercialize it. And I think that's a nice place where Start Engine and equity crowdfunding solution fits in. And you'll also hear about companies raising capital from angel investors or angel local angel groups or venture, cap venture capital firms. So you mentioned a lot of different things uh, and we've heard them, but we may not necessarily understand them. So if you can talk to us about what the number is realistically for if we needed to raise and we should ask for friends and family and for seed uh, investments and for series A and series B, I know that yours is up there, but mm. what are what are all those terms? What do they mean for us? Yeah. And this is generally speaking, right? These are sort of nomenclature and they vary depending on who you're talking to. But I would say pre-seed and a friends and family raise can normally be equated. And that's for your first external round of raising capital once you've already put your own funds into the business or bootstrapped it. And maybe you're looking to raise anywhere up to the first half a million to a million dollars is generally what we'll call a pre-seed raise, a friends and family raise in the industry. And as companies grow and you get to the next stage of your development or the next stage of your commercialization, you look to raise a seed round. And that's typically your second external round of capital where you may still go to some friends and family as a part of that seed round, but you're also talking to what I'll call more traditional or institutional investors. Potentially you're talking to angel investors who tends to be higher net worth individuals or accredited investors who are in your community. And maybe they have started and sold businesses in the past and now look to support other entrepreneurs through funding their businesses. A platform like Start Engine can fit into a lot of seed rounds where you're looking to raise maybe between the half a million and three million range is generally what I see. And Start Engine, quite contrary to raising an angel round from high net worth individuals or accredited investors, we allow companies to raise capital from anyone, both accredited and non-accredited investors, allowing founders to really broaden their reach and cast an incredibly wide net in terms of who could be an investor in your company. You can now raise capital from your users, from your customers, from your industry contacts. And we've generally found that it's a little easier to convince 100 people to give you $2,000 each, for example, than two people to give you $100,000 each. That's true. So. We're at a point where we say, I think I want to crowdfund. So there's Indiegogo and Kickstarter. If you can share your experience and some information that you could provide the community about, is this something that I should do? Start Engine might be a little bit higher um, at, a, at a later point, 
But to start with, do you think that Kickstarter and Indiegogo are good resources for us? I do. I think they can be great platforms for the right businesses. And when you're thinking about crowdfunding, whether it is through a rewards platform like Indiegogo or Kickstarter or an equity crowdfunding platform like Start Engine, you want to make sure your value proposition and what you're building can be understood by the general public and someone who doesn't have an underlying industry expertise or will see why the unique approach you are taking to the space you're disrupting, um, you need to make sure that that value prop is distillable down into something that's really easily digested by the general public because those are your typical either backers or investors through a crowdfunding context. And I think if you can answer that question for yourself, it tells you whether that's the right path to go down. I have this idea. I am limited on funds. I want to be able to manufacture it. Maybe I have to do some tooling. I need some production. I want to offer some kind of reward to people that are out there to donate to my uh, cause and to build up uh, some money to be able to do what I need to do. And then come Start Engine at a later time. So typically, what type of companies uh, work with you, Harrison? Yeah, generally companies that have had success through an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter model can be really good candidates for crowdfunding shortly after that raise when it's a really good fit to fund your first production run. And once those units have been delivered to backers and you're starting to scale revenue and sales, that's when Start Engine may be a good fit. I would say Generally speaking, companies that are building consumer products, consumer packaged goods, brands that you're selling direct to consumer intuitively make a lot of sense with equity crowdfunding, where you can go out and raise capital from the people who know and love your products, know and love your brands, and at the same time, build a sense of brand ambassadorship, where you're going to have one level of kind of commitment and brand affinity from someone who essentially pre-ordered a product through an Indiegogo, for example, you're going to have a whole other level of backing and ambassadorship and affinity if that person actually owns a small piece of equity in your company. And now they are incentivized to help you grow and scale the business. Very interesting. I know that crowdfunding, there's uh, a couple of inventors that I know that are doing it. Um, you really need to be prepared. You need to have good videos, good offer, um, good information for people to catch right away. Many people think that going on a crowdfunding website is going to make your product go viral, mm. but it's a lot of work, Harrison. From your experience, and many of us are probably in the Indiegogo and Kickstarter stage, but I know one, one thing that I've seen is that you need to keep asking your friends and family and your social media contacts quite a bit uh, you, you have to keep asking them over and over and over again. And the cost of actually launching a campaign and having a successful campaign could end up being uh, expensive. So do you have some information uh, just from your experience? Because you, with Start Engine, you're the director of fundraiser. I don't think I, I uh, mentioned that earlier. But you have tremendous experience and background of raising money and knowing what people go through. So you can probably be intuitive in a way to know mm -hmm. when somebody comes up with something, what they need to do. But it, I know I kind of have two or three questions in there, but if you can answer, that would be fantastic. Of course. And there's a really good slide in here, Brian, called what you put in is what you get out that I think is helpful to have up. But it's funny, I've I came from a more institutional traditional finance background where I was on the debt capital markets team at JP Morgan, helping raise very large hundred million dollar plus up to several billion dollar uh, dollars of debt financing for very large late stage public companies. Mm -hmm. And now at Start Engine, I've probably spoken to over 3000 founders over the last three years and helped them raise tens of millions of dollars plus. Wow. And I, I think there are a few things that are that hold true when it comes to raising capital and growing your business, regardless of the stage you're at, whether you're in a total ideation stage as an inventor, whether you're just filing your patents, whether you're just about to go to market, whether you're doing hundreds of millions in revenue a year. And number one, which I sort of alluded to earlier, is 
you need to be able to clearly communicate your value proposition. What is the problem you're actually solving and why is this important? Why is this something that's investable? Number two, have a clearly defined go to market or growth strategy if you're later stage. Is there actually a product market fit for what you're developing? Why are people or businesses going to buy this? And how can you explain that to someone? How are you going to act and succeed going, going with that plan? And then the final piece, which I think you put really well, Brian, is capital raising is a full-time job. And with equity crowdfunding specifically, I think the real beauty and uniqueness of it as you compare it to more traditional funding models where I've spoken to so many founders who over the last two years spent hundreds of hours, flew to 10 different VCs, spoke to 10 different angel groups, and whether you get funding or not can be incredibly binary. It's a yes or no. Whereas with a crowdfunding model, we've learned that the efforts you put in, the amount of people you're willing to talk to, the extent to which you're willing to put yourself out there and talk to your family and friends and talk to your networks and talk to your communities and give them an opportunity to back you and give them an opportunity to invest, those efforts are going to be directly correlated to a degree of success. I think that's what's, that's what's really powerful. And crowdfunding very much is this type of capital raising where you get out what you put in and I don't think founders or inventors should feel bad or be ashamed about going out and asking for money. You are giving people an opportunity. And if you truly believe in what you're building and what you're developing, you should be excited about giving people the opportunity to have exposure to that and own a piece. That That's very interesting, Harrison. And look, there's many ways for us to come up with the money. Crowdfunding is one of them. If you feel like you can really get behind your campaign, give a good offer and know that, look, you're getting money most likely to start manufacturing your invention, or it could be for a prototype, but most of them I see are for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So you need to be prepared that you get the money, you're going into business to manufacture, right? So a lot of times when people put the campaigns out, I see that they either raise a good amount or they don't raise a good amount. And then they're like, oh, I have to manufacture. And they're not sure because it's something brand new to them. Uh, maybe just some tips and advice on what you've seen uh, with successful campaigns that are out there. Sure. And I think speaking to your point on you need to be ready to manufacture when you raise this capital. So going in with a very clear plan of, I am going to deploy this capital in X, Y, Z ways and having a really clear use of proceeds. Now, if you go back to the slide, that's sort of a triangle. Um, it, it This really tells the story for me um, is it? where with the green circle and the orange yep. triangles, see, that's the one that really is. tells yep. the story for me of how raises are successful. And this is assuming, right, you have a compelling story to tell. And you mentioned you have maybe a video of what you're developing and sort of this investor facing, very easily digestible piece of content on why you're raising capital and what it is you're raising capital for. But founders who have a really clear understanding of who they're gonna go out to when they go out and raise a fundraising round. And this is true regardless of whether you're going through an equity crowdfunding platform like Start Engine or you're talking to local angel investors in your community, or you're pitching venture capital firms, you need to know who you're talking to and know what they're looking for. So on Start Engine, some of the most successful raises I see are the founders who really commit themselves to going out to anyone who knows them, anyone who knows their business and has an existing level of understanding of what they're doing. Because it's much easier to, to convert a person who knows you personally or knows what you're building or knows about your industry into an investor versus someone who has no underlying underlying level of commonality. Very interesting. So you've seen a lot in your time, Harrison. What do you think makes a good product or a good business successful? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. There are, there are a lot of things but the number one thing I see actually isn't about the product or the business, but it's about the inventor. It's about the founder. And I think the funny thing about building a company is it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of skill, but it's always going to take a degree of luck. And 
if you continue to have the grit and enough grit just to survive, and when you have very downtrodden capital raising markets like we've seen over the last 24 to 36 months, when you have situations where your industry, we saw a crypto web three blockchain winter over the last two to three years as well. If you're able to survive through those downturns and just keep your idea, keep your company alive through hard work and grit until you get a little lucky, that is where I see businesses find success. When we're on our way, let's say we do the crowdfunding, we go into manufacturing, or maybe we started a business and uh, we're starting to get business going. At one point, at what point do we say, you know what, we need more? When is it? Is it when we're losing money, when we're making mm -hmm. money? If we're making money, do we need to raise money? As the uh, crowdfunding director and guru, what, how do you answer that? So we have a, a funny motto at Start Engine, and it's that founders should always be raising capital. We've now raised over $75 million for ourselves over the last six, seven years from over 50,000 investors, people in our community. We like to say we get our own dog food where we are a crowdfunding platform that only raises capital through crowdfunding. And, and I think you never really know where things are going to turn. And it's none of us have a crystal ball. None of us know where the, the world, the macro environment or our specific industries that we operate in are going to turn in the next six, 12, 18 months. So when times are good, it, it can't hurt to raise capital and pad your balance sheet and give yourself enough wiggle room, give yourself enough runway where you can weather those storms when they come and you can stay alive for that moment when things turn in the, turn in the right direction and you have that lucky moment. What do you think an inventor needs to do? Because that's pretty much our audience here. Uh, some people are further along the way and some are just getting started. But what do we need to do to be prepared to present whether it's even if it's friends and family and you have one shot to show your idea to them or you're pitching a seed investor, what kind of person or who is it that we're really pitching we have to learn about before we do? But mm. what have you seen? And, and we may look, we don't have gazillions of dollars to make fancy videos and everything else, but maybe just to get started, what do you think are some good things that you've seen that that's impressed you? Sure. I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. And one is from a preparedness perspective and very top of mind, take advantage of the resources you have here and people like John and people like Will helping with building out an IP portfolio. Intellectual property is incredibly important to investors. So if you've put those pieces in place of protecting yourself with patents and framing out a go-to-market strategy, framing up a commercialization strategy, that in itself has immense value to potential investors. Now, going to the day of the pitch, when you're talking to friends and family or talking to a, a VC firm or talking to angel investors, putting your pitch on a page on a crowdfunding platform, you need to be really clear with your message. I think there are so many pitches that I've heard where founders go on a little too long. And it's understandable because inventors and founders, you're so knowledgeable about what you're doing and what you're building. And you're so in that space that it's hard to step back sometimes and see the forest behind the trees of how do I explain this to someone who has not spent tens of thousands of hours on, the, on what I'm building like I have. Hmm. Inventors, if you're listening and watching, you can ask questions. Pretend like you want to raise money and ask Harrison questions while while he's here with us. Harrison, the expectations of when we do invest, what should we expect? Like with I said, expectations, but how much are we giving away? Mm. How much are we sharing? What what's what's that look like? Because I want to be able to keep my equity in my yeah. company. I need money. So there's that dilemma. How do we evaluate what we should ask for and what we should give away? Really good question. And it's a part of the decision making that will really determine what type of investors make sense for you to go after. If you are in a really 
technical industry, for example, and you see a lot of value in what we call a strategic investor. Maybe it's a fund of a VC firm that has experience in that space and only invests in businesses in the, in life sciences, for example, or in medical devices that can bring an immense amount of value to the table and they will appoint someone to your board of directors. They'll sit in on, on quarterly meetings and they will help you guide the business in a direction and potentially find exits or connect you with people who will help help you grow the business going forward. If you are looking for what I'll call friendlier investors who aren't really concerned about directing the business in a certain way and being very active in terms of where you seek additional funding and how you grow things, maybe right angel investors could be a better solution or friends and family. And if you're looking to raise capital from a baked in community around a company, or you want to raise capital where you do largely stay in control and you're not giving up as much equity and you're not giving away voting rights, that's where equity crowdfunding may make more sense because our rounds tend to be very founder friendly where you're not giving away a board seat, you're not giving away voting rights, but on the downside, you don't get that benefit of a strategic investor who's been investing in companies in the same space for decades. That, that makes total sense. So there's a, a couple questions that are coming in. I see two here. Uh, Enzo is on the app asking, uh, how do you find these investors? And we also have uh, Vico, how to get in touch with angel investors or VCs? Yeah, definitely. A lot of it is geographical, which I think is sometimes un unfortunate and why online capital raising through crowdfunding has become so popular is there's a really high concentration of these angel investors and VCs in certain locales on the West Coast in Silicon Valley and in Los Angeles and on the East Coast in New York and in Boston. But I think the best way is to is to seek out and search what are local angel groups in my community. And there will be some in a lot of the towns and cities out there. And it's finding them and finding people who are likely entrepreneurs who have grown their own businesses in those communities. And they're in a way they are incentivized and inclined to pay it forward and reinvest and help founders who are coming out of those same communities that they did. Very interesting. So are there websites? Uh are there, are you familiar with grants? Because I know you're active with fundraising. Like, what do we do, Harrison? We want, we need money. We might need it to make a prototype. Is that okay? Are we only asking if we're going to go into manufacturing? Maybe once we get the money, we don't necessarily know who we're going to sell to, mm -hmm. right? Because we might not have had this kind of experience and now we're going to invent something and, and manufacture it. And now we're, we're going to have to sell it. So getting the patent and prototyping, that's great. Now we have 5,000 units in our garage. Yeah. Now what? So what do you think is kind of the flow of, of what an inventor needs to do? Sure. I, raising capital is hard. And I think firstly, as an inventor, you need to ask yourself, what do I really want to do with this invention? Do I want to write create it and then license it out to someone and have them handle selling and commercialization? Or do I want to build an actual business out of this? And I think that is very telling in terms of what type of funding, what type of investor should I potentially go out after? And we raise for a lot of companies that receive significant grants from the NIH, from the Department of Defense, from a variety of sources. And I think grants are a really positive way to do that, to get through that initial stage of development, right? And build a prototype and really figure out for yourself, what do I want to do with this company? Now, if you do truly want to scale it and flesh out a business plan and a go-to-market strategy yourself, that's where it can make more sense to talk to what I'll call more traditional, sophisticated investor groups like a local angel investing club, like maybe you have connections within your personal networks, people who have started their businesses or invested in companies in the past or go to an equity crowdfunding platform. But mm -hmm. the number one question is really understanding what is my plan? What is my future goal here? And that will help you understand where you should go to find capital. Excellent. There's a couple more questions that came in. Let's uh, see if we can quickly go through them. Uh, so Michael's asking, how can you keep constantly giving away shares through each round? Are you able to create more shares over time? 
Yeah, it, it's a really good question. So companies will authorize shares that you can go out and sell to investors. And generally, as companies are growing, you're also increasing the value you're putting on the company. So every time you go out and raise capital and sell equity, you're not necessarily doing it from a pie that stays the same size, right? As the company grows sales and you achieve milestones and you get additional patents that are granted, the implied value of that company increases as well. So the pie that you are able to sell equity and also grows in size. Wow. Okay. We have Andy with Start Engine. What's the turnaround time to raise money? Do you do a fixed price share or a Dutch auction style where you can raise money more than expected? Yeah, good question. Generally, it's around a two to two and a half month setup process. And you mentioned earlier, Brian, there's a lot of boxes you have to check and you really need to get your ducks in a row when you're going on and raising capital, especially when it's in a public fashion, like with equity crowdfunding. So in those two and a half months, we'll provide a lot of resources, helping founders build a landing page that explains the offering, build legal offering docs and, and regulatory documentation that you need to file with the SEC to raise through these crowdfunding exemptions. You set a valuation and a price per share before you go live on Start Engine, so investors will know the terms they're getting, but there is ability to oversubscribe raises to Andy's question, raise more than you initially go out for, and make amendments to the offering to take in that additional capital and that additional demand. Uh, we have a question from uh, Herb. He's asking, can you define SBIRC? So so in S, it's a type of grant is what I'm familiar with th through the SBIR. For Small specific... business. Yeah. Something. Yep. Off the top of our head. Uh, but thank you, Herb. We'll, uh, we'll find more out for you on that uh, with grants. Uh, in the app, um, Enzo is asking every VC that he spoke that he's spoken to is only interested in investing in AI technology. What does mm. Harrison think about that? It is um, it's an interesting trend that we've seen really emerge since OpenAI has made almost weekly headlines now for a while. And, and it's something we experience as well. A lot of the institutional capital, right, VCs are really only interested in funding AI companies. And we speak to so many consumer packaged good companies and real estate companies and life sciences companies even who are having a difficult time raising capital more traditionally. And I think that is a, it's been a really strong tailwind for equity crowdfunding platforms like Start Engine, where we're trying to fill a gap that has been left by this shifted interest um, of VCs. So I think it's a really good point from Enzo and it, it's the environment we're in. And you tend to see capital raising environments run in, run in cycles and the AI craze has come and we're in the middle of it and it will fade at some point. We've all heard the term bootstrap, right? Bootstrapping. So uh, some of us will just, you get a little, you save a little, you do a little more and you just keep going and until you build it up, hopefully it's something that uh, you can do without adding more people uh, or companies to get involved and start uh, giving away shares. But like you said, that could be one part. And then like you said earlier, like you always wanna be raising money, mm. right? So uh, very interesting. Um, Harrison, in the presentation, uh, in, in the slides, was there anything else that you'd like to go over? I think maybe just to leave everyone with sort of a resource um, to refer back to the, the last slide, talking about where you can go to either apply to Start Engine, you can reach out to me, other members of our team, and know that we're really here to not only help founders and inventors understand, is this the right fit for you? Is equity crowdfunding the right path to go down? And if not, what are other potential avenues? But if Start Engine is the right path to go down, we'll provide a lot of that support to help you make sure you do this raise in the right way and position yourself for the highest likelihood of success. Very interesting. So Harrison, we've uh, I appreciate you spending a little extra time here with us today. We're uh, a, a bit over, but amazing, great information to the inventor community out there, no matter what stage you're at, you want to be prepared. You may want to uh, do this right at some point, and now you have the information that you need. So depending on where you are in your invention journey, 
uh, this is great information to uh, to keep handy. Harrison, you've been involved with uh, inventors, entrepreneurs, startups, successful businesses that continue to keep raising. If you can share with us, because there's inventors that are all different stages here listening and watching mm -hmm. you tonight, what are some words of wisdom that you think can help us to keep us moving forward with our big ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question to distill it down. Um, I would say really ask yourself and understand why you're doing what you're doing and why you're creating what you're creating. Because I'm a firm believer in when you are passionate about something and you're building something for the right reasons and you really know that you're solving a problem, you should stick to that and other people are going to feel that passion and they're going to sense it. And that is going to help a lot of pieces fall in place for you when you're pitching people as potential investors, when you're pitching people as customers or partners, or you're at the stage where you have 5,000 units sitting in your garage and you don't know who to sell them to. If you really believe in what you're doing and you can communicate why that is to other people, generally there are going to be other people out there who will feel the same way and feel an, affin an affinity for that. And I think that's really what I'd leave everyone with is communicate why you're doing what you're doing. Be Wear your heart on your sleeve. Explain to people why you've spent so much time and made so many sacrifices to be an inventor and take that risk and potentially start a business. Amazing. And if you choose not to go the path of manufacturing and raising money and all that, there's many inventors that go the licensing route. So yeah. you're looking for a manufacturer with distribution and they would manufacture it and they would sell it and you would earn a royalty from it. So sounds like an easier path uh, to find a company that is a good match and also feels great that they're going to be able to sell enough of them to make it worth their while and your while is something that uh, has to be uh, aligned to be able to make it so a licensing deal. And that's another option. And then there's the bootstrapping, whether you're going to license it to get it to that point, or if you're gonna manufacture it. But then there's all the different things that you went over this evening. The crowdfunding at all different levels. There's the, the, the seed funding, there's the venture capital, there's the series A, series B. I don't know if there's any more, but, uh, it's it's fun to watch companies grow and I, I, you get to do it every day. It is. It, it's incredibly inspiring to watch companies, ideas grow, raise capital at, at all stages. And there are so many different options and avenues out there to your point that inventors and entrepreneurs can, can explore and go down. Fantastic. Harrison, your website and where we can stay connected with you, um, whether it's in uh, on LinkedIn or the your your website, if you could just give us uh, some contact info. Absolutely. Startengine.com is where you can go. If you're looking to raise capital, startengine.com slash raise capital to apply to potentially work and raise with us. You can always reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email, Harrison at startengine.com. And I am always happy to have conversations with founders, inventors, whatever stage your idea or business is at. Amazing. Harrison, thank you so much for joining us. National Inventor Club, all the community members, we appreciate you. And Start Engine seems like a great resource. We hope to all get there at some point to keep raising money and building our companies and businesses. So thank you again for keeping in touch. And uh, please tell uh, Kevin O'Leary that we say hello. I will. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thank you, pleasure. Harrison. Thank you. All right. That wraps it up for National Inventor Club, uh, March 2024. And uh, you can head over to the After Meeting Networking Zoom link that everybody is invited to. So if you have received an email because you're on our email list or you're in the Inventor Smart Community app or you were a guest, an intro guest th this evening, you have received the link and we will see you in there. Till next time, have a great evening. Keep your inspiration going, your inventions moving forward, and we'd love to be a part of it. Come join us in the Inventor Smart Community app. Thank you and have a great night. Keep your big ideas going. Thank you.